everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to today's uh, lunchtime uh, artist talk with uh, Linda Quinlan. Hey, Linda. Hello. Hi, uh, everybody. Today we're going to talk uh, about Linda's practice um, and particularly about uh, with emphasis on a project that uh, she developed for uh, the current uh, Glutzman National Sculpture Factory uh, temporary installations around Cork City, a uh, project entitled Graft. Uh, this was a collaborative project that commissioned artists uh, Adam Gibney, Vanessa Donoso Lopez, Breed Murphy, Shodino Sullivan, and Linda Quinlan to create new temporary sculptural interventions in Cork City. Um, this was a project that aimed to transform, disrupt, and celebrate the existing built environment and bring a temporary cultural transformation to Cork's urban realm, inviting the public to view new artworks at a safe distance as offered by outdoor presentations. Um, Linda Quinlan, in her video painting and sculptural practice, weaves a kind of visual alchemy, choreographing a playful set of relations between image, objects, and sound. Through investigation of material processes, her inquiry burrows deep into the folds and forces that determine our experience of the material world and our relation to it. And her more recent work is grounded in the activity of painting, developing imagery that aims to capture both an ecological and civic spirit and question ideas of love, survival, nature, and the feminine. She's a graduate of the MFA program at the Pietzbark Institute in Rotterdam and NCAD Dublin, and has a BA from the Crawford College of Art and Design here in Cork. And her recent exhibitions include a solo show at Berlin Opticians Gallery in Dublin and a group show at Skol Lorcan, <laughs> Dublin. Lorcan. She's exhibited at Bloomberg Space London, IMA in Dublin, Oakville Galleries Toronto, Centre Renan de Art Contemporain in Alsace, the Douglas Hyde Gallery in Dublin, the RHA, the U Lane Gallery in Dublin, the Glucksman, and the Crawford Gallery in Cork. And for Graft, Linda engaged with Cork City's renowned English market with her painted designs of oysters, lemons, and other foodstuffs adorning a series of customized aprons worn by the market traders of its various stalls and shops and activated through their interventions, or sorry, their interactions with visitors mm -hmm. and customers. And in creating this new work, Quinlan captured the living, vibrant spirit of the market and developed a sumptuous visual vocabulary that appeals to both appetite and our senses, taste, smell, and touch. We'll be looking at that project as well as numerous others. Um, and if you have any questions for Linda, you can pose them using the chat or Q&A function on Zoom, and we'll try and answer uh, what we can. And keep in mind that this conversation will also be posted to the Glucksman YouTube channel afterwards, in case I didn't mention that to you before. <laughs> <laughs> no, you haven't. <laughs> no, I was the last minute. Sign um, my life away. <laughs> oh, you just slip it in there. <laughs> very happy to welcome you to today's talk. And, uh, and uh, perhaps the, the first thing, maybe just to give some idea of what I've just uh, explained, is maybe to mm -hmm. kind of bring up some images and we can kind of talk a little bit uh, specifically about the graph project, maybe to kick things off. Great. Yeah, thank you. So hi, everybody. Um, so I'm just going to talk through a little bit about the process and the project and how what you're seeing in front of you came to be. And, and I guess um, I'd like to just kind of start off just by thanking Chris for the opportunity to get to talk through the project. I'm going to very much kind of focus on it um, because there's quite a lot of material there and there's quite a lot that I'm unpacking too. So, um, so I guess to start off, when I was first approached and invited to make work for this particular project for Graft, um, to choose a site within this Cork city, somewhere that came immediately to mind was um, the English market. And I guess growing up in Cork, I've always thought of the market really as the heart of the city. And, um, you know, just a heart really because of its central location of the city. For those of you who know the city of Cork or are living there, have been and visited the English market, it's um, kind of situated right in the centre of Patrick Street. And it has these kind of many tributaries and alleys that filter out, filter out to the streets of Cork. And I guess that's why I was really thinking of it as being a heart, as some kind of part of an anatomy. And kind of something else as well. I mean, these were kind of, that's a way for me to kind of almost, um, yeah, feel my way into the project is thinking of it as a body in some way. And I also was thinking of it in terms of a belly because of course it's connection to food and everything like that. But also because of, for those of you who've been there, there's these amazing um, cathedral-like arches 
that are kind of like in this kind of one larger space. And um, it just always reminded me of being inside the belly of a whale, you know? And um, so that was quite striking. And, and they were things that I, I just, yeah, immediately kind of wanted to kind of work within that. I mean, I, and I also was working um, with food in some kind of relationship with, with oysters and mussels and kind of um, things like that. And so I wanted to, in some way, extrapolate and kind of like, I mean, it was a starting point. And so I was drawing really on the materials um, of the market for graph. And I created these aprons here and that you'll see on some of the traders. And um, yeah, and I guess I really wanted, as Chris was kind of talking about, <laughs> he took the words out of my mouth because I really wanted that capture that kind of living vibrant spirit of the market that's something that was really important for me and develop a really rich vocabulary that um that was kind of drawing on those aspects of food and kind of things that could be found in the market and um I guess that kind of notion of like what appeals to our appetite in terms of imagery was something that I was thinking of too and trying to draw in that relationship to kind of our senses. So things like kind of taste, smell and touch um, were also really particular to the imagery that I kind of wanted to develop. So you'll see within some of the imagery, there's hands and I have some kind of other images that you'll see the kind of paintings and drawings and sketches later on in this presentation that, um, so we'll get an opportunity to see that. But for now, I guess I just kind of wanted you to, yeah, these images of the actual aprons on the market. And I guess starting off then the market was really kind of offered a rich space to think about the sphere of sensation and taste, as well as consider the idea of how an artwork might actually be flavored. So thinking about how an image might, um, how I might make an image that is bitter or is sweet or salty or sour. These were kind of things that I was thinking of and kind of thinking about what kind of foods I would bring in that to do that and kind of bitter thinking in terms of kind of, I guess, um, kind of emotional and kind of bitter as well as kind of like that flavor and taste. So playing with that kind of emotional range within the um, choice of kind of images and things that I wanted in the paintings. And it just gave me this opportunity, I guess, really to explore food within an emotional and also a kind of cultural economy in a way that I hoped might open up more imaginative ideas of relationship and an exchange. And, and I guess the apron, how that came about um, in terms of like, you know, being the kind of like surface for how, how do I bring my paintings, you know, um, into into the market how do I you know insert myself in there somehow this was kind of like you know a question I was trying to figure out and um and there was something um you know the that Chris had kind of pretty much mentioned in the brief in the beginning he said that you know the in the brief the project brief and we were asked how graft or how we might graft our own work onto the actual kind of fabric of the city and the image, I guess, of grafting and this reference to fabric really stayed with me in the process of developing um, just kind of like, you know, ideas. So thank you, Chris, for that. But actually, I really latched on to that word fabric because I guess I've always thought about clothing and fabric as really being like this first architecture of the body, you know, this outer skin. And, um, you know, really thinking about like, how do we extend ourselves into the world? How do we extend ourselves into um, this kind of environment of the market, I guess I was thinking of. So fabric offered me a way to do so. And so the idea that my paintings could then just be printed onto fabric and worn as aprons by the traders just became very exciting to me, you know, and, um, and that. I guess the idea as well also that the traders be, could become the actual canvas for the painting um, and that my paintings could almost take on this performative role within the space and environment of the market was something that um, appealed to me greatly. And also, I guess, like, I really wanted something to create something in the project and for the traders that was also useful, you know, and that was kind of practical to them. And so on the site visits while I was there, and, um, you know, I saw that everybody was wearing markets or that, you know, they had in some way um, this, this kind of like, I guess this layer 
in some way that's kind of um yeah uh, that they, I mean, it was something that they were using, sorry, I'm kind of thinking, but there, I guess for me was that kind of almost surface of them becoming kind of like, you know, like the trader and in their place of work, it was kind of, um, yeah, just an interesting way for me to feel my way and become physical within the project and within the space. And so, um, and I guess, so there was site visits and there was meetings and emails going back and forth, kind of organizing participation with the traders. And there was an invitation sent out to the traders and, um, you know, asking for their involvement and for their participation. And, and it was just so, so joyful because the response I got and the take up from the traders themselves was so open and immediate and kind of like, um, so many people came back and, and they really understood what I was trying to do and they wanted to be involved. And, you know, they started to describe themselves as walking canvases, you know, and as living and as a living exhibition and things like this. And that they connected in that way, you know, was just um, so meaningful for me, actually. You know, it was just this kind of um, very joyous. And that was something that I wanted the work to speak of also. And, um yeah it was just that they were connecting and responsive and yeah so it 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 was so great and i guess being in the market really and um, with the traders is what brought the project to life essentially and and they responded so well and that connection and care for the project for me is really where the magic happens you know and um i guess the idea that the english market can become a place to actually see and experience artwork, but also that the artwork itself becomes part of the infrastructure and the fabric of the actual market is something that excited me greatly in developing the work. And, and I guess a question that I kept coming, coming back to in making this work for graft and, and thinking about the market was really like, what are people hungry for right now? This became a question, you know, for me, um, that was quite important. And, and I guess for me, it was really answered by this yearning for joy and connection again after a long, long period of restriction. And so my hope is that the, the project speaks of that. And, you know, and graft really in the city, everybody's projects, you know, became a real moment as well of art ownership in the heart of the city. And so yeah and and i guess even kind of thinking about questions um I was going to kind of bring in um how questions are really instrumental actually in my own practice and, and kind of it, in developing a work and they're kind of questions now that i'm forming even kind of around the project itself um and i was going to maybe come to some of them if that's okay chris yeah um, so, you know, just yeah, I know you, so sorry there, Linda, to interrupt. Uh, and yeah, I mean, if you're happy to kind of read from the response, I think that kind of relationship that you, you, you forge with, with the traders is, is a very kind of fascinating kind of process. A little bit. And I actually just want to step in there to just kind of Please. probably relate it as a little anecdote about, you know, that process of also the project coming together. Um, where I know you went through various iterations of how you could activate the space, how you could kind of uh, use it as this kind of site. Um, mm -hmm. And this moment that is, is very striking for myself and for, for Dobbs O'Brien when we were meeting with you and some of the traders, mm -hmm. and when you kind of hesitatingly pitched this thing of, well, I have this other kind of idea, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, not necessarily kind of paintings or kind of large banners, but you know, this idea of the, the aprons as a thing. Um, and of course, we immediately just, we all got, like, everybody, all the traders got this, this thing. And I wonder if you could uh, talk about a little bit about that kind of, before, before you actually, you know, relate the responses of, of the traders themselves. So you can talk a little bit about that thought process that took you to the aprons. Okay. Uh, I think it's, it's very interesting to me. Yeah. Um, well, I guess, like, you know, as, as you were talking there, you mentioned other things, like, you know, so fabric was that material and that way for me to insert myself, you know, and kind of bring these paintings and that imagery into the space. So that, that felt like, you know, okay, that's the way to go. And, and I guess material is really important to me in my project. I would almost think about myself really as a materially kind of led 
artist. Um, you know, so I'm always thinking about the histories and the context, particular to a material, and also thinking about, um, I guess, the kind of potential for a material to say something new as well. You know, that that's always kind of there and inherent. And, um, and so the initial idea, I mean, I was making lots and lots of drawings and there was a lot of back and forth kind of like sharing of these, so the, you know, and there was different foodstuffs and, you know, I was looking at the various different stalls and things like that. Now, in the end, there was two um, designs that were used. So there's two different aprons. Um, but the, um, the drawings that I was making at, at, at one stage, I was thinking about like that these would be draped in some way, kind of like, you know, kind of sculpturally are kind of hung within the space and within those kind of high cathedral, like whale belly shaped, you know, that infrastructure was where I was going. But, um, I somehow, it didn't feel real for me. It didn't feel like, yeah, like kind of getting to the heart almost of the project in a way. And, you know, so I was developing the drawings and, you know, and these paintings, but I was just trying to connect and, and kind of feel real about it. And, and I guess I just, I actually don't even know where the apron, you know, it because it, it didn't even come from, it came before the site visit, I was coming down. And I had, I had these other ideas of like wrapping the building in these kind of like gigantic swaths of imagery, you know, on the outsides. And because we were also thinking about, you know, like having the work available to the public, you know, at any time of the day, you know, there was these other kind of like, you know, aspects that were, um, you know, to be considered. And it just didn't feel, it just felt really bombastic and it didn't feel, I didn't feel the trader kind of within it or something. I felt like, you know, it was like an insertion, but kind of like, um, you know, it, it could have gone and done that, but it just didn't feel right. And yeah. It, um, it's interesting to me as well. You know, I, I, I think one, one thing that, that we certainly love about the project, I can say collectively here for the Glutzman and the Sculpture Factory, is that each artist in, in a way kind of took on that idea of grafting with interventions that have a certain kind of sense of a, like a special encounter or something that isn't there mm. all the times so that there are kind of moments where it kind of changes um, and i'm just thinking here of say adam's works that are triggered by rain or or the the way that vanessa's work is immersed in water and kind of is affected by tides or breeds mm -hmm. where it can be seen at nighttime and with your work as well that idea i think of of the encounter as something that may or may not happen or will happen to varying degrees depending on who you see when you see them which people are wearing the aprons, which people are washing the aprons, mm -hmm. all this kind of thing. So the sense of, of kind of creates this kind of, this kind of specialness, I think, around it. Um, uh, that, you know, it will always change. It will always be a different thing you'd be looking at. Mm -hmm. You'll always be having a different response or a different relationship to the work. Um, and I wonder, and particularly, I think that was one of the things that really appealed to us about that idea of the apron as well, is that it felt very much kind of deeply entrenched in this idea of happenstance and, and, and occasion, I think. Uh, I wonder if that's something that you, you, you think about in terms of your work. I know you, in some of our initial conversations, you also mentioned a kind of a move towards more non-traditional exhibition sites as well. Um, and I wonder if that's something that uh, you see as also being effective in triggering a certain kind of relationship or a certain encounter between your work and the individual spectator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really great question and observation. And um, thanks, Chris. Um, um, and I guess, yeah, that kind of encounter is something, you know, um, I mean, for a long time, I've made work that was in galleries. It's kind of, you know, I've been kind of working that way for you know, close to 20 years. Um, and so, and there's been moments where, you know, I think it's like very satisfying to kind of like work within that room, but it's been interesting for me to yeah, approach these other spaces because they 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 already kind of come with the material in a way, you know, and it's it's really, really it's really interesting to kind of think and, and, and connect and kind of genuinely connect to kind of what makes sense in this given situation. Like how do we act? You know, what do we put forward? Like um um and, and how can we see each other? You know, so I think it was really important for me to, you know, see the traders see the see the people see especially after you know we, we haven't seen each other in a long long time and, and there's almost like 
there was something that was interesting for me also about um, the market, like in a way, the, all the staff and, and the businesses there and everybody who works and comes to the market every day, um, there's almost this kind of given in a way that they are a community. You know, that, that it's kind of like, you know, centered. So something for me that was interesting to think about was like, you know, I guess like how, um, how do we gather again? Like, you know, and even kind of within our communities, how do we gather and how do we see each other? And, you know, so this encounter that you're talking about and this almost kind of like, you know, um, yeah, witness to something where you're kind of like you're in shopping potentially, like, you know, for something, but you also might encounter something where, you know, there's staff and then you might gradually realize they're all wearing an apron or something. It's kind of punctuates the movement and the kind of like choreograph something that's already there within the market itself. You know, those movements and how people are kind of like, you know, working away. But I kind of like the idea that the, the aprons by kind of being worn by the staff and the traders there, um, you know, just the people um, who are wearing them, that it amplifies and kind of charges it for a moment. And so no one will see the same configuration. You know, like yeah. whatever you do see as an audience member, it's, it's really pertinent to you. And, and I think that's how we see the world essentially kind of too. You know, we kind of bring our own experiences to these things. And, and so there's something flourishing and really kind of an act of making happening in the very witnessing of this, um, yeah, like these bodies through space, like, you know, that are just accentuated. So it's kind of like a weird, like ballet or something. You know, or some it, kind of... has, it has such a nice parallel, I think, to the way in which you, you work and develop the project. And, and I'm sorry to have steered you away from this a little earlier, but maybe we can kind of come back to it with, you know, some of the conversations and actually even kind of questions that you post. Uh, so that this project, <laughs> you know, it has this manifest, that manifestation through the kind of aprons and the way people experience it. It <laughs> also is imbued with this whole process of kind of dialogue and conversation and kind of, and, and, and hearing from them and hearing their thoughts. And I wonder if maybe we could return to that with, um, you know, some of the questions you posed and some of the responses yeah. that uh, informed the project that came from the traders themselves. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe even, yeah, because I have, um, Chris is speaking there about, you know, in preparation for this talk and everything like that, I was kind of like thinking over it and I was like, I really need the voices of the traders here. Like, you know, because that's for me really essentially where that kind of magic was happening or it's where it stayed for me, you know? And so, um, and I guess a question that I was even just forming for my very self, um, you know, like one of those being like, what are people hungry for right now? And then the other one was kind of like, you know, are we being good ancestors? You know, like to, because there's something about the market that really, really speaks of ancestry. There's a long, long tradition, like, you know, and kind of like, um, like craft that's happening. So many of the people there, um, and the businesses there come from a long line of people working in those businesses, like maybe butchers and things like that. Um, so that was fascinating, like quite. And so um, I did ask a couple of the businesses and the traders there. I asked them three questions um, just in res just to kind of like get their responses and get their voices somehow kind of into this conversation between Chris and, Chris and I about the project. So should I read those now or something? Will I do yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, I think they're yeah. kind of fascinating. If, 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 yeah. if, if you want to read one, I can read one. Brilliant. <laughs> well, maybe I should start <laughs> off by like the three questions that I asked people um, was, what was it in your life growing up that you feel shaped you to go into this business? That was one question. And another one was, what is it that you want to bring to your customers? And then there was a third question, and um, what do you run into that is challenging in the industry? So Chris, you read something there, all right? Yeah, go on then. Um, so um, yeah, it's, I thought it was interesting. So you pose it to uh, yeah, O'Manny's family butchers, to Emer yeah. O'Manny. So they are fabulous. Yeah, oh my God. I, like I, I wish. I bring back up the image. I'm actually not. I don't think yeah. this is Omani's here. This but is Omani's. Yeah. In here for it. Yeah. Um, and you said so. What is it? What was it in your life growing up that you feel shaped you to go into this business? And Ema responded, "We are the next generation of butchers from a long line, which began with my great grandfather, who came from County Limerick and set up business in the market in in 1898." Uh, my mum was brought up in Ballinlock, where the slaughterhouse for her father's business in the market was situated near the home. We were raised in the hinterland of Cork City, where our granddad once farmed and our uncle Michael kept his cattle, so he continued to be connected to the land on some level. 
Our mother, Catherine, was a wonderful cook, so we we're fortunate enough to pick up some very practical skills, and she instilled our love of good quality and nutritious food. She never let anything go to waste and could make any leftovers into the most delicious meal for another day or nutritious soup from the chicken carcass. These skills have been paramount to our knowledge of our craft and our business. Um, and then when you asked what is that you want to bring to your customers, uh, she said, we want to provide our customers with high quality and nutritious meat. We want to provide products that are hard to source elsewhere and come from small producers such as lamb from our uncle's farm, pork from the Irish Pig Society, McCroom Buffalo, and Horn Hill Rose Veal. I want to help them use their time and money more efficiently through the skills I picked up from my mom, such as making a cut of meat go further, so that cooking seems less of a chore for busy families. And then finally, the last question that you had there, Freeman, was, uh, what do you run into that's challenging in the industry? And she said, it's sometimes challenging to get people to realize that we're a small family business who can never compete with supermarkets on price, as they often sell below cost, but we can compete with them on quality and service. Our team at Omanis are highly skilled, knowledgeable, and passionate about our products, and our local customers recognize this and value it. And the current situation with COVID is challenging as the volume of meat from our wholesale customers has been reduced considerably, but we have been very fortunate to be able to trade through the lockdowns. Uh, footfalls also reduced in the city with the closure of shops and the increase in online retail that once would have drawn people to the city. So very much there kind of said, you know, I think bringing to light, you know, the kind of fam familial connections, the sense of kind of community there, I think, in the project as well, which obviously has heavily informed your own kind of response to the graft remit as well. Um, the kind of, I don't want to say that you're just personalizing, you know, the individuals who work in the traders, but actually kind of digging a bit deeper into the kind of experience which, as we can see from Emer's responses, is very much different from the supermarket shopping trip. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it is that because it is an experience. I mean, even knowing like, um, you know, I'm not living in Cork at the moment. Um, but whenever I am in Cork, I, I remember like every time I'd always try and go, whatever way I was kind of going through the city, I always had to go through the English market. I mean, it really has and holds that mm -hmm. experience. Like, you know, I mean, I, I think you can kind of change in its kind of like, you know, um, movement through it in some way and what I love always about the market it's not um, like the onus isn't on this place of acquisition you know and I think it's really about um, yeah it, that kind of drawing out some curiosity and um, just kind of exploring I mean you, you can kind of dip through it very quickly or you can kind of shop and I, I think even just with COVID and everything you know this kind of it really came to the fore ground how much and who was an included in that group of kind of like you know um just kind of that that front face of kind of frontline working you know and and for you know maybe it's the first time ever we started to look at those who we were buying food from in in a very different way and holds their kind of value differently kind of for us and there's something even this like layer of the market and and you know just their story of even that kind of um, being able to kind of stay buoyant and kind of survive it and you know that loyalty of kind of customers I mean you know there's so many people we all rely on each other like you know and and I think it's important to kind of draw that out again and just I guess it kind of comes up that another question that for me was running through um, running through the I guess it's kind of coming up for me now is thinking about like what creates psychological togetherness, like, you know, in, in ways of thinking about kind of how we gather. So in thinking about the market and the community and the customers and things like that, um, for me, it's very kind of interesting to think around, um, I guess, yeah, that kind of notion of gathering again and seeing each other and, um, you know, I think we physically get energy, you know, from, from each other, from that kind of body to body, that's literally kind of happening. And, and that kind of metabolism, like, you know, is really important in, 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 for me in making work, but like, you know, for me also in kind of going through my everyday, you know, and it was just so lovely that like there's such a great culture of care within the market, you know, for, as Emer there kind of like spoke about um, from that kind of aspect of like where they're sourcing and why they're sourcing and 
um, you know, thinking about, I guess it's this question again, like, are we being good ancestors? You know, like, what are we planting? What are we buying? Like, you know, just to come back to these things every now and again. And um, well, um, maybe, I mean, there's great generosity in that, like, you know, even thinking about the future, like, you know, um, yeah, people that we haven't even met yet, you know, but, you know, and yeah. Sorry, Chris. You I know, know you're all right. I mean, in, th in terms of generosity, of course, you know, one gesture is, 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 is the aprons themselves. I wonder if maybe we could talk a little bit about the designs and, and the work. So, you know, the relational aspect of it, of course, is, you know, integral to the project, but maybe to kind of specifically look at. Sure. I have one yeah. here as well, but I'm not, I'm not very good. <laughs> Go on, whip it out. <laughs> I'm, I'm saving it for. You'd make a wonderful model. Yeah, I mean, well, so these are the two that. aprons on screen that I designed. And, um, and I think there's there's a couple of um, is the next slide perhaps Chris you know it might kind of move into kind of one oh yeah and that's the painting maybe sh and I wonder is there a way to go back to because for some reason I kind of love the idea and this was an observation that Dobbs had as well like that there was kind of never a moment where we would kind of reveal the painting as mm. such because I think it displaces somehow like you know this kind of value of like the apron and kind of the image itself. But, um, but at the same time, I kind of didn't, <laughs> like, um, I'd love to just kind of get onto um, an image more so. I wonder of like the, this one with the lemons and the tears, and maybe I can talk around that. You is this, maybe I'm cheating now by kind of, is there, you know, the very first image, would that be really tough oh, to yeah. kind of go back yeah, to? Fine. You mean back from here? Yeah, that, like there was one of, um, Rosemary, she's wearing it in the chocolate. Yeah, but maybe that's kind of tough to kind of maybe see the image as well. But maybe I'll just talk around it. <laughs> Sorry, I'm being, I'm being kind of maybe I'm avoiding this or something. I don't know. <laughs> um, okay, so so this is an image, I guess, where I was kind of starting off. I, I have to say, actually, now I know where to start. Actually, so the pearl is something that's really really a motif that's been coming up for me kind of um quite a lot in the last couple of years and and it's really been wonderful to stay with something i mean i actually was kind of like in, in terms of a motif you know um i kind of really feel like that kind of language like i you know like having something like that um it's been really great to me I, like I thought there's always been kind of these trains of thoughts and ideas and subjects that have run through the work but I've never actually stuck with the kind of motif as such or you know like so the pearl is something that I'm going to continue making work about I guess that's what I'm trying to say and like and why pearls are and, and oysters and mussels and things like that are interesting to me is kind of what it um speaks around and I guess I was talking about how material and you know, is so important to me. And oysters and mussels are these, um, I guess, just these bodies, these things that, these creatures that have been cropping up in my work quite a lot. And the reason so is kind of really around my interest, around their ability to produce nacre. And nacre is that substance that creates a pearl, and it creates it really as um, the nacre, as an autoimmune response of the body of the oyster or the mussel um, to um, just protect itself from any incoming debris or something like, you know, a grain of sand. And what it does is the mussel or the oyster, you know, these um, mollusks will actually secrete the um the substance of nacre and in successive layers and wrap it around the um the per or sorry the, the maybe this the piece of sand you know and so this just became really interesting for me um that you know in a way that it kind of speaks of like the care it has for itself you know in so you know like some little kind of tears or you know um, just um and, and kind of like you know so so i guess the pearl for me speaks about um something that is born out of a way out of kind of pain or trauma but ultimately it's an act of love and care for itself you know in terms of how it's produced and that would kind of was something yeah, quite interesting for me because I've always been interested 
in situations are kind of like when something like materializes out of a situation. So something's kind of like reactionary and actually produces a material in, in a kind of like, um, yeah, in a, I guess in, in an event like that. Well, and um, a real affinity to the apron then as well, doesn't it? I know they're, you know, they come out of this, you know, the canvas works there that I kind of briefly, briefly showed with that sense of kind of, you know, protection and envelopment and, and, and layering and, and then actually yes. see them kind of become these aprons and are they kind of worn and wrapped around <laughs> Beautiful. Them, kind of kind of garments. Uh, it's kind of a fascinating kind of uh, affinity Thank that, you. that, 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 that this content has with its form, I think, you know. Uh, thank you, Chris. That's a really beautiful observation and very generous of you to say, because I love that. That's given me lots of food for thought, I think, like, you know, and there's something that was really wonderful, even the, like, you know, the, the surface of the apron was very kind of tactile. It's this kind of suede finish. So, you know, like thinking about the aprons, they needed to be like practical and useful and waterproof and like fire rated and things like that. So it's this kind of like suede vision is the name of fabric but um, to wear it like it's really soft and brushed and it almost has a kind of pearlescence kind of like almost this kind of shimmering yeah, sensibility shit, kind of like you know and they're really lovely objects you know I know it's my work and I shouldn't really say it but you know I no but they are and and so a lot of the traders when they put them on they were all like rubbing themselves you know it was like really really and you know we were kind of giddy and laughing around that like you know and it was really exciting but but in so in this particular like you know image there's these two um two lemon slices and there's these tears coming from them that the, the painting or the work of the, this apron is called um lemon tears muscle love and so the idea really of and um, how kind of lemons and mussels came to kind of be. There's also was kind of thinking around, I guess I was doing some research of the mussels and the oysters and markets. And every time I researched, like, you know, I kind of put, throw into Google something like, you know, mussels, oysters, there was always a lemon in the corner or something like, you know, or it was always in relation to some kind of lemon. So I was playing with this idea of like how could um, lemons and how could mussels, you know, um, how could I move that relationship from a kind of culinary relationship, you know, thinking about kind of food to almost an, an emotional kind of relationship in some way. And so also when I was th thinking earlier about like how an artwork might be flavored, you know, um, thinking around like could something be bitter or sweet you know so I kind of wanted to make something like bitter in terms of like you know some aspect of like you know just sorrow and and then kind of sweet in terms of kind of care and this kind of tender aspect of things kind of coming in you know which was significant in in my work generally like it's kind of a subject I like to think about but also like this culture of care that's coming through in the market as well and so the image itself has these kind of like you know these I guess their eyes, these kind of lemons, and they're, there's these kind of like teardrops, you know, and they're falling, there's this kind of lemon juice, <laughs> and it's kind of exuberantly kind of like splashing. And then there's, um, there's these hands that are coming up from the muscles. I don't know if you can really see it in these kind of images, but there's these hand forms, and they're, um, you know, just coming up to kind of offer, offer some sense of comfort, you know, That's to crazy. the lemon in that kind of distress. Yeah. So ultimately the image is kind of this, um, it's an image of love, like, you know, kind of thinking like around like can lemons and can mussels, like, can they be like, you know, soulmates in some way, you know, and so being playful around food that way and those relationships and kind of that perception is something that, I don't know, it, you know, it's, it's kind of exciting to me like and I do quite like my work like has this aspect of strangeness to it you know and I'm really interested in that kind of ground there's kind of a risk in putting something strange out like it's a strange image like you know and it's a strange thing to think about you know um, lemons and mussels being soulmates you know it's kind of risky and silly but it's an it's a kind of quality that I do like to bring into the work in a way. And I think it's it's to do really with like, you know, I don't know, like how strange the world really is. Like, you know, I mean, how strange are, you know, kind of the logics and kind of like, you know, um, yeah, like our biases and, you know, all these things. Um, 
that I guess kind of that game of meaning, like you know, um, how yeah things are meaningful and how things kind of matter, um, and how strange all is that, and you know, and almost in a way, if we yeah kind of begin to perceive the strangeness of our world in that is something that I quite like, you know, to kind of break down the conventional logic in some mm. way. And I think this might be in one way, it's a kind of a nice moment to move into that film Ananas <laughs> that I kind of chosen yep. as a, it's an older work of mine. I knew um, we were going to go out of sequencer, but would you like me to bring up that film or do you want me to bring to the, the images of it? Yeah, maybe the images of it would be good. So just bear with me why. Yeah, because Chris and um, how I kind of just came to this work or something is ananas. Um, it's a, it's a, so ananas is the a French word for pineapple. And it's a work that I made for my um, graduate show at the Pizzoort in Rotterdam. And it was made very quickly. Um, you know, so this is it here. This is it actually installed in Oakville Galleries in Toronto. And so you'll see here it's, um, it's a, a video work essentially, but it has this kind of physical sculptural kind of presence. And so this is silicone that's on the ground. And so the video is played on screen and it's four minutes long. And, um, and I guess like the, yeah, um, almost, I guess because it came up because of like the strangeness, right? So like in this work, there's a, it's, there's a dancer. And, um, and I was working with green screen at the time and green screen to me was really interesting as a material and I was kind of thinking around it really as its material quality as this kind of thing um, that's kind of caught in this pre and post production, you know, um, this kind of and I was really working with it as I would kind of work with something even like clay, you know, kind of thinking of it in those terms and and so the silicon that you saw on the ground earlier um, you know, that was kind of almost a kind of signal also again to kind of just physicality and think, you know, it's silicon is a mold making material and it's really quite kind of difficult to, um, to work with to kind of stir. So I had to mix in this dye and we poured it onto the floor and it's kind of like really moves quite slowly, but then sets, it's almost geological, <laughs> like, you know, and it's kind of like, you know, movement and stuff like that. But it was another way to kind of think about the physical space and the virtual space, this kind of on-screen world. But, um, but the work itself very much it talks about, um, yeah, like I guess I was trying to create a site of transformation, like, you know, that tried to kind of activate that kind of site of transformation where um, there's these various things that happen in it and there's various objects. So there's, um, there's pineapple and then there's like the pineapple is also a snake but the, you know the snake is a dancer and so it's all these kind of bringing together these disparate um, kind of forms we're trying to connect them and you know there's a game of tennis being played also so it's this idea of trying to um, I guess bring things together in a way that seem disparate and you know that we would almost consider that there wasn't this potential for connection within them and they come into a kind of synchronicity for a moment so they create this almost kind of like provisional mm -hmm. temporarily kind of narrative and then that kind of falls out kind of again and I, for some reason like with this film it can speak of so much for me i, I kind of get a lot out of it like there's other pieces that are, you know things that i've made i'm like oh god not that or ooh, you know um, but there's something about this that I always kind of come back to and it keeps kind of growing for me. And it helps me make things for some reason, like, you know. Like when you yeah. talk about the, the silicone thing and the way, the, the, the fluid and the way it settles, I mean, how important is it to you, um, you know, relating this work back to graft? How important is it to you that you kind of surrender some kind of control over these kind of processes? Because obviously some of these things that come out of your hands, is that an important thing for you to kind of, to relinquish a little bit of that kind of, you know, artistic autonomy or that kind of, uh, that kind of foreknowledge of, of how it works going to end up. And I wonder, you know, is that something you see as kind of carrying through your practice, this kind of sense of, you know, not necessarily happy accidents, but kind of a stepping back mm. and letting it play out? Yes. Oh, you've just caught on to something. Like, it's really lovely to have a conversation with you, Chris, about this, because you're really, you know, you've caught on to something. <laughs> No, because it's something I never noticed actually now that until you're saying it <laughs> and, and it was all, yeah, 
because yes, like it, there is, I mean, for me, it's the process. Like, you know, when I'm um, making a work, I don't know what I'm going to make. Like, you know, and actually I really love those parameters in a way. Um, I mean, it's important to have some parameters like, okay, you're going to work in the market or I'm working with green screen or something, you know, like, um, but there was something in making this particular work. I made it really, really quickly. I made it after a show that I did in Bloomberg. And I made that show for Bloomberg and there was many, many pieces and, um, you know, and there's video and everything like that. And it was, I was coming up to my graduate exhibition in, um, in Pete Swart. And I remember a lot of like, you know, all the tutors were like, okay, Linda, like, you know, you've made enough work now, that's your graduate exhibition there. And you now just have to kind of, you know, maybe think of configuring it differently. And I, I was like, oh, great, that's great. Cause I'm exhausted, you know, <laughs> fabulous. <laughs> And then I had one tutor, Bernard Krauss, and he came into me. He's like, what? No, you have to make something else. Like, you know, so this one person was like, you know, yeah. And, you know, and that's who I went. I was like, okay, I have to make something else, you know? And I really had maybe three weeks or something like that to do this. And, you know, I was like, okay. And um, so kind of reacted quite quickly to it and, you know, and made this work and it happened very fast. And it, it was really lovely. Like I was allowing a lot of things to kind of come in in a way that I hadn't expected it. So there's a soundtrack of um, a tennis match being played out and like how that came in. Cause I was thinking of like, you know, trying to insert some kind of dementiality, you know, like, you know, or something like that. Like I wanted to, this film is a loop. So that was kind of creating a circle. And then I was like, oh, and I remember I was like editing it. And in the background, a friend of mine was like watching Wimbledon. <laughs> and it just like, so this soundtrack of the tennis match, like this pop, pop, you know, this almost kind of like, you know, this rhythm of being back and forth between the players just became this kind of inserted, I don't know, like brought a dimension. Mm -hmm. to the video to this flatness of kind of screen for me and you know so it's really lovely in those moments where something comes in and you just let the world in i mean it's really just like how we want to be in in life like you know kind of like you know you have some sense of yourself but like that changes all the time and you're just allowing the world come in continuously and you know so that it's kind of relevant and maybe you know in that moment and um I, must, yeah, so I, I, have the, I have the film here. Do you want to maybe show an excerpt of it or? Yeah. 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 So, so I guess Chris, like, you know, that was, yeah, that's, that's happened. You know, that, um, yeah, these nice little accidents kind of happen around stuff. And that's really important as a process to keep it live, to keep it kind of vital and fresh, you know, they're qualities that I want in the work always. So this is the start of it. This is a dancer um, that I worked with and her name's Maria um, Dovnik. She was a dancer actually in a school nearby to the Pete Swart called Code Arts in Rotterdam. And so we worked together in the studio. She's wearing these leggings, these pineapple leggings, but there's this lovely moment where the screen, yeah, she's almost that kind of leg comes and is like almost kind of beckoning someone to come with them, like, you know. And so I guess this is a video where kind of everything, you know, is partly something else, you know, legs are a snake, a snake becomes a kind of like, this shape here is like a crocodile, you know, like this kind of snapping and, um,
And I guess in making this work, this is like, you know, as I was talking earlier, that I really wanted to bring a kind of energy or a metabolism to the screen. And I wanted the work to move in a way, you know, and have this energy that kind of, you know, kept in motion. There's kind of this, always this nice kind of ecology that happens. Like, you've kind of got this snake figure, and then it's kind of like a crocodile, and then it's a... Uh, it has this almost kind of like when the dancer was bouncing up and then it has like this frog, you know, so there's this kind of strange ecosystem of evolution or something happening, like, you know, um, and then at that moment there, um, you can hear this tennis game and it gets quite excited in the background, like when she's jumping up and down, it's really when the ball is going back and forth and that crocodile, when it was open, its mouth says something like love 15 or, or something like, you know, actually I can't remember because love, it's love when you actually both get the same score. It's when you're tied, isn't it? Tied, isn't it? And it says something like, you know, yeah. Um, so they're kind of like, you know, it, it ushers something there. And then this is um, a piece of footage at the very end that I had filmed outside college. There was a pond there. And up at the kind of middle, there, you know, there's these poles, reflections, but there was a heron there. And that's what I was videoing, actually. And I really liked how these poles also kind of mimicked almost that heron's neck, you know, and there's this kind of wobbliness, almost like when you're swallowing something. And then I had this tennis ball come in from the side and it almost kind of appears, it could be a sun or it could be a tennis ball. And then this kind of um, wire mesh comes up underneath. It's like a racket in it and it's kind of serving it out of the screen. And I guess that had a relationship, that yellowness that saturation that was with the silicone on the floor as well, kind of like that spill. Yeah, so there was those kind of connections. I feel like I've lost the energy for that piece watching because it was slow there. Like it's quite a quick paced thing. Like, you know, it's a lot of kind of back and forth and sound and stuff like that. But I'm really glad, you know, I do feel that it complements in a way um, what was happening in kind of like parts of kind of graft for me, maybe as a kind of process too. And um, it's very interesting to go back that way. You can see, I mean, even the way you talk about kind of the process of making, I think, or the, the way you let these things kind of, you know, kind of filter in through this kind of serendipitous moments in a way. Yeah. Um, it feels, you know, quite in line with, with some of the, the things you talked about and some of the things we experienced, I think, in, 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 in Graft as they came together as well. Yeah. Um, I'm aware that it's five minutes to two already. It has yeah. gone very, very quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it has. It's good. <laughs> it <was laughs> and I'm also aware of like, so much. I know there's a lot of images and information there that um, but we'll, have to, we'll have to get you back soon. <laughs> <laughs> there was one thing. There was one thing that almost might be nice to kind of end on, like, you sure. know, in terms of because um, we were talking about, like, you know, earlier, those kind of like exchanges, like, and those kind of that I was witness to, actually, like, you know, in the market with the traders. I mean, that's really where, um, like it was such a pleasurable experience, like, you know, um, being kind of witness to a lot of that gaming. And, you know, just to see that kind of interaction between the traders and their customers. Um, and there was kind of one, I remember there was one moment that's really lingered with me and I was just going to describe it, if that's okay. <laughs> Um, but it was like it was amazing like so I was kind of watching this woman it was like she was it was the last um uh, it was the last person that I kind of come to with the aprons you know it being around the market and I was giving them out all day and so I finally got to this one woman and I was like you know you're down you've you know in the project and we, you know we had a chat and she was really interested but I'm just trying to get to it. I'm always trying hard to get to the moment. But <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're running out of time here. So I'm just like, well, yeah. um, but there was, but there was this really amazing moment where there was a man and he wanted to buy some meat, and you know, it was like he took out his purse and he was like in opening, getting ready to pay the lady, and the lady said to him, she was like, you know, oh, it, it's okay. Like I, I know you're gonna love this, so um, you know, um. I know you want to come back some, you know, sometime. And the man was just sitting there, like, you know, standing there with his purse open. And he was literally kind of disarmed by the lady's response. Like, she was like, what? Oh, you've been really kind. You're giving this to me for free, you know? <laughs> and she was just being so generous. 
and so kind in that moment and also kind of like there was this aspect of her being really kind of like confident i mean it was almost kind of you know it was a business move too right you know like yeah. i know she you're gonna love this a good product. Yeah. yeah you know she's like you know you're just gonna be back here again you know and this is you know but so she was kind of savvy in that as well. And I just kind of love those combinations of things, Chris. I was literally myself kind of caught off guard and so was he. And I was wondering like, was she doing this for my benefit as well? Cause I was looking at her. So I really saw her in that moment, like, you know cause she really took charge in some kind of way. I mean, she did the unexpected thing. Like, you know, there's a man buying something now you pay and you're given the thing, but it was such a kind of, yeah. I mean, this disarmament in that moment was something that's really left me kind of thinking about like how those qualities might make themselves into an artwork, mm -hmm. like how, you know, something that's kind and generous, but also like kind of savvy in its kind of delivery or like how can art do that in kind of some way? Um, yeah, it's just given me lots to kind of think about, like I'm untangling it, but it was, I don't know, it was a great moment to be left with. And it's given me something to kind of want to make and maybe, yeah, think around how, how the next work might have those qualities in it. And I have to say thank you for your own generosity, Linda. It's been an absolute pleasure you know, working with you, but also talking with you today and sharing some of this stuff with everybody. So uh, um, oh. thank you. Thank you for everything. Oh, thank you also, Chris. It's great. Cheers. Thank you.